Welcome to Weekly Infusion with Dr. Drew Pinsky and Dr. Bruce Heishober. Weekly Infusion addresses medically related topics. It's in the know, entertaining, and everything you want to know about health and medicine. Now may I present to you the very wonderful Dr. Drew and Dr. Bruce. And here we are. The Bruce, how are you? Good to be here. Weekly Infusion, very exciting today. Uh, right, we're, we're also on Facebook right now, Facebook Live. If you want to be a part of this conversation, be it, we'll be at 323-649-8268. 323-649-8268. Uh, anything new going on with you? More time in the ER. Yeah. And, and ep- opiate epidemic, working addiction medicine, more and more patients with opiate problems. But. Yeah. Are we, are, are we seeing them more willing to come in for treatment? Or are they seeing the diminishment in the prescribing practices or anything? I'd say the the most uh, substantial change I'm seeing is less people approaching me in the emergency room looking for opiates. With specific, and you know, I need Norco, I need dilaudid, Norco, whatever. Right, less expectation and understanding that, uh, you know, new guidelines saying moat, you know, with uh, non-steroidals being first line, using them more for acute injury. So it's. I, I think there's a good. There's a move in the right direction, but I think treatment needs to be. You know, as we've talked about, I think there needs to be more realistic treatment, not just throwing suboxone at people, yes. or et cetera, et cetera. Thank you. Well, we're going to talk about something different today. We're going to talk about law enforcement and victimization. I'm doing a special with uh, Elizabeth Smart. Exciting. Yeah. Uh, the special, the the uh, documentary, which was her autobiography, was last week, and it will be airing again next week when you're hearing this. But I will also be doing Elizabeth Smart Questions Answered, which is a, I think it's a one or two hour interview I do with them. I don't know how long it's going to actually be. It's at 10 o'clock on A&E. Check your local listings as well or go to AETV.com. And uh, it's on November 20th, Monday. The documentary will air before and after that uh, that special as well. I spent a couple hours talking to she and her father. It was very interesting just hearing what she went through. It was just it's breathtaking, this documentary. It's unbelievable. And she's a very intelligent <clears throat> spokesperson for that whole Very intelligent, topic. pretty well put together, yeah. You know, been through a lot, and just is able to live her life remarkably well. And, yeah. And his, um, it's funny. There are a couple things. I, I, I wrote an article. I think I'm going to put it. We'll put it up on Dr.com eventually. Um, about some of the things that were surprising that I learned talking to her. And one thing was, to a large extent, a lot of the story was about, I don't know how else to describe it, as being a woman in an awful situation, in that one of her captors was a woman, and the fact that that woman who has mothered six children couldn't come to the rescue of a 14-year-old was deeply uh, incensing to her. And she also is very upset how women tend to take responsibility for things that happen to them. In other words, uh, my friend Lawrence Savan, who was one of Harvey Weinstein's uh, right. victims, yes. she said when she when he started doing his thing and she froze there, she said first thing after she froze was, first of all, what's going on? I don't understand this. Secondly, how did I get here? What did I do? What did I do? How did I get? Women always start this inventory of what did I do to get myself in this situation, even if it was completely random. To that, to that topic, we have Steve Cardian in here. He's written a new book called The New Superpower for Women. Steve, that's a good way to get into this, isn't it? Yes, sir, Dr. Drew, it is. Thank you. So tell us, what are we going to learn on the new superpower? Well, you know, one of the most important things that I try to do with women is put them in touch with the gift of intuition. Uh, I, I have a, a network of hundreds and inst- hundreds of instructors across the country and around the world. And I wrote the book so that they would have an encyclopedia safety to go to and that every parent could buy this book, read this book, and then pass it down with the knowledge that's in it to their to their college age or high school age daughter. And when you say intuition, what, what specifically are you asking women to tune into? Well, you know, intuition is knowing something without knowing why. My first experience with intuition was when I was 17 years old, walking on a beach. Long story short, I was going to walk 15 minutes away at five, the five minute point. I turned around, I came back, I ended up saving a, a young child's life who was buried in the sand when 20 adults that live in vacation in the beach, at the beach, uh, didn't even respond to my request. Does anybody know mouth to mouth resuscitation, uh, rescue breathing? Uh, so, and I've experienced it over and over and over in intuition. And what, what I found in the cases that I've investigated with crimes against a woman is that in most all of the cases, uh, where a woman was face to face with some sort of a predator that beforehand, she had that feeling something's not right. Whether it was a woman on a date and, 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 and she was raped while on that date, or it was a crime against a person for robbery or some sort of a scam. She had that feeling. However, many of them disregarded it. 
And do you, how do we ex- do you have any questions, Bruce? Because this topic fascinates me. Right. Well, I was going to ask you about women versus men and the the whole intuitive aspect of personality. And is is there any science behind women having more intuition or men? Or I know this is specifically about women we're talking about. But we'll talk about men too. Go ahead. Well, you know, if if you look at the statistical data, Dr. Bruce, it would say that it's about equal. I believe that in every society, men are more violent than women, therefore women have that greater gift. Uh, however, they're also more apt to put it aside. Um, I, I do a lot with the media. I, I, I'm, I work with Inside Editions uh, investigative unit. And I went onto a college campus and I got eight women in a row to invite me in their car under, under a roost to see how trusting they were on camera. And I, I, all eight allowed me, got me in their car and drove off with me in less than 30 seconds. Uh, so they have the greater gift. Uh, however, they're, they're, they're more often to put it aside. I wonder what the adaptive advantage was, the, the putting aside part. That's the part I, I get why they have more intuition, because it's about child rearing and about protecting themselves and things, but why they would discount it. Maybe that's a cultural thing in, in today's world. Well, you know, I mean, how are they, they, they're growing up, they're, they're, they're raised to be nice and polite and proper and give people a chance and don't be judgmental. So that's a part of it. That, that's a part of it. And, and some of it too is, you know, we have the vagus nerve running through our body and that reaches out to every organ and it's a two-way communication. Uh, you know, that's where you'll get that, that, that sense of foreboding, that, that tickle in your belly, that, that, that tinge in your, your chest or the hair on the back of your neck going up. Everybody has it differently. And we, we find through our research that if you're not paying attention, if you're not employing situational awareness, awareness, if you're not scanning your environment, you're less likely to pick up on something within your environment that may be a threat. I, I, I don't know if you have uh, you came to this about the vagus nerve on your own <laughs> or if you're quoting Stephen Porges' work, who's something we've done a couple times on this show. Uh, are you talking about Stephen Porges and all his uh, vagal nerve work, the vagal theory? Uh, no, just in my research. I'm, I'm not even sure who he is. Do you need to know yeah, Stephen Porges? He's the, he's the guy that really developed this whole uh, science. No kidding. Yeah. Stephen Porges? P-O-R-G-E-S, Porges. Uh, all right. And, and, and that's what I, I'm, I'm constantly pushing on. Like, how does that part of our nervous system that's not our central nervous system that's peripheral and autonomic, how does it pick this stuff up? It's so interesting to me. Because you're right, the 80% of the vagus nerve is afferent. It's coming back to our brain, which we were not taught in medical school. No. And we didn't right. get any information about that. And there's two different, there are actually three or four different vagal nerves. Some, some are myelinated, some are unmyelinated, some are above the diaphragm, some are below the diaphragm. And how these things interact to give us our intuition, it's what, what you call a gut feeling. Literally, the vagus is pitting, picking up something from your gut. I wish I could understand what. Do you have any theory about that? Well, you know, life, life experience has, has a place a part of it. Uh, I'm very sensitive to it. If, if, if I go to a crime scene, uh, like the, the, the jogger in Queens, the, the young girl that went jogging and was murdered in Queens, I, I went there to do a, a segment with another media outlet. And I felt this overwhelming sense of sad. Mm. And, and uh, women are way more in tune to that, to that feeling. You know, if you believe a guy's a creep, he is. If you feel that you're going into a dangerous situation, you are. And the more that I can uh, profess to them to listen to that feeling, you know, stop for a minute. How do I feel about this person? How do I feel about walking into this situation? How do I feel right now? I'm walking down the street. I'm thinking about making, taking a shortcut. How does my body feel? And, you know, we could do it through meditation. We could do it through sitting and being quiet. We could do it through doodling. Uh, you know, I don't mean meditation. So you could just sit there quietly. Every morning I get up at, at 5, 530, and I, I, I go out onto my deck, and I, I sit, and I listen, and I take in the environment. Now it's dark at, you know, 530 still. So it's interesting that my, my sound has to play so much. My hearing has to play so much a part of, of that. And so you mentioned earlier it's constantly scanning. Tell us how, how somebody, I mean, it's a hard thing to discipline ourselves to do all the time, right? Or is it scanning the environment or is it scanning our body to make sure we pick up on when something uh, you know hits us in the gut or the chest? You're scanning your environment. So when I tell women, when you walk into a building, just look 
to the left, look to the right. See if something pops out of you. We all we have a baseline. Uh, the baseline in New York City is different than a small suburb in Tennessee and different from being at the beach or being at the park. And you know, your your subconscious can pick up on these abnormalities, something that looks out of place. When you walk out of a building, scan. I tell people, be sure you know where your exits are and make sure that you, you create a blueprint, have a plan of action for something that would happen in the event and you'd be prepared for it. What about the uh, the predators or, or the perpetrators? They, they're acting pretty quickly. What can you tell us about them and how to sort of notice them? Well, the, 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 Grace, the Greystone Stein study in 1981, they did a study where they put uh, a, 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 a video recorder out on a busy Manhattan street between X amount of hours. And they took this footage that they had done for weeks at a time and they brought it to predators in a, in a prison in New York state. And they, independent of themselves, they asked each prisoners, murderers, rapists, killers, pick out on a scale of the soft targets versus the hard targets. And they all pick the same people and they let petite people, men and women go by. They let elderly men and women go by. And what these researchers discovered was that the predator was sizing them up just like we do. Uh, you know, in, in law enforcement, I, I've got to make a, a, a thin slice, split second decision on somebody. It can make the difference between me getting hurt or getting killed or a prisoner escaping or somebody else getting hurt. So they, they, they judge these people by their stride, their gait their posture, the, the way the correspondence between their hands and their legs were. Uh, and they all picked the same people. So it tells a lot about that what your mom told you and your dad, walk, walk assertively, walk with a purpose, head up, chin, you know, chest forward, uh, you know, look bigger than you are, act like you know, you're proud and project that energy that you're not one to be messed with, that you are a hard target. Uh, by not paying attention. The predator, 70% of the predator's game is the element of surprise. And if we take that away from him by being able to scan and pick up his presence, we have removed a large part of what he relies upon. Now, how many, how many of those women have a history of abuse as, as children or previous rape or domestic, uh, violence. A, domestic violence? Because it seems like once, uh, as I know in addiction medicine, women that have had sexual abuse when they were younger are more at risk, et cetera, and they carry a certain uh, behavior pattern with them. And I think, is that what some of these guys are picking up on some of the predators? And is there, how do you, do you deal differently with those women in your courses or is that not something you address? Oh, absolutely. I, I deal with them differently in terms of, you know, accept, accepting them to the class. I mean, if, if they're in, if they're in therapy, I, I want to know where they are and has they, have they discussed it with their therapist? Uh, but we do see women uh, who have been offended or violated earlier in their life that they are then again reoffended, and I think you see that in your research. We see it in the military. Uh, we see it with girls that were sexually assaulted in high school and going off to college. Um, but anybody can be selected as a target for the victimization of a predator. Have, have you tried to observe what what those qualities are? Have you looked carefully at, at the childhood sexual abuse survivors and tried to sense what that guys might be seeing? No. What specifically are you thinking? I don't know. I, I sometimes they they project a provocativeness that I could see how somebody could think about that as uh, you know as somehow evocative, like they they have no idea they're doing it. But I could see right. how somebody could misread that, and they have no idea they're doing it at all. And there's also a kind of a weird. I only call it receptivity. There's a relaxation in, where there shouldn't be kind of thing. Like when you're examining them stuff, certain it's like no no no, no. just. <laughs> Just sit there. Just you don't. Have to, this shouldn't be. You almost feel like you're re-traumatizing them just by going through an exam. Right. And I, certain muscle groups start relaxing. It's like, uh, 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 uh. right. I, I look. It's sort of like the axis two feel with yeah. a patient, whether borderline or something that's that's histrionic or or uh, you know dependent personality disorder. Those kind of traits. But I think that does set you up for uh, for this type. Of, be more uh, specific. What do you mean by that? Um, well, I think when. Just like the the picture of somebody having abuse when they're younger, because yeah. that that predisposes to personality disorders of various types. Exactly, and, and and I think that's part of what predators pick up on. What we're picking up on, we pick uh, it up on it from a helper healer. Yeah, yeah. 
Uh, no, I'm picking but, up on very specific, tiny behaviors and things. They're looking for an overall something, maybe, right? Right. But so, are some of the cues the same that we pick up as unhealthy and we want to help them because this is what contributes to being a victim and substance abuse right. and the predator? This is what I want. This is, But it's right. an instantaneous thing. Interesting. Do you agree, Steve? I, oh, sure. Absolutely. Uh, you know, uh, when you say unhealthy, both mentally and physically, or when you use the word uh, wounded, I mean, you know, what what does the predator in the wild, the cheetah doesn't go after the, the quickest or strongest because it goes after the slowest and the weakest. So, what, yeah, for what, sure. What do the victimizers say they're looking for? What do they articulate or do they? Uh, they're they're looking for what we refer to as a soft target. That's someone who's not paying attention. For example, when I selected uh, going beyond the college roots, I've got 21 out of 21 in social experiments uh, with uh, with Inside Edition, where uh, I select that target. And how did I do that? I looked for the girls that were on their their cell phones. I looked for the girls that were texting. I looked for the girls that were eating their lunch, reading their notes, coming out and saying, "Oh man, it's a beautiful day. I'm out of here." The girls, women and women that walked out of that institution and just looked around, maybe they saw me, maybe they didn't, I let them go because I knew that they would be a much harder target. So preoccupation, not paying uh, attention to your your surroundings, not walking, you know, with a purpose, keep your head on a level. You know, if you see somebody that's a threat, you know, a lot of people, if they see a threat off to the left, you know, they look down or they look, look away, uh, you know, practice in the mirror, practice with your friends. You know, you see, you're walking by them. We do these exercises in class. You're walking by them, you keep your head on a level and then just give them a little glance backwards once you pass them, just to put them on notice that you know that they're up to no good and that if if they do something, you're prepared. Does, you know, I've, I've wondered the, the way sexuality is projected in media, entertainment, and when women, young women see this and start to emulate some of the, the dress and the behaviors, uh, does that do you think that's created more risk for women in society? Because clearly sexuality is flaunted like at no other time, at least the way I see it. Well, you know, as a as a man, as a woman's empowerment instructor, uh, it, it's hard for me to suggest a woman to a woman how to dress. But I, I will tell them it's better if a woman tells another woman how to dress. But I, I do tell them that if they dress a certain way, if they project a certain uh, 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 posture about themselves or, or maybe a personality, that they could attract unwanted attention, which could cause them some significant problems. Right. And, and you're not you're, and he's not telling them how they ought to dress. He's just saying, here's what I, I don't yeah. never tell a woman that you sh she a woman should be able to dress any way that she wants and go any place that that she should. But also recognize, you know, that there's certain behavior uh, going into nightclubs by yourself, accepting a drink from a stranger. That's high risk behavior. Uh, you know, if 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 you engage in that high risk behavior where you're you're taking a risk, right? Uh, right. You know, like the first the first three four months of freshman year college is the most dangerous time in a young female's life. Now, it's not conceivable, but if it were to happen that they didn't drink during that time period, sexual assaults would go down dramatically. Yeah, I, I watch TMZ. And I see the people coming out of the clubs, and the, they're all provocatively dressed, but the uh, the famous people have the have the uh, bodyguards and uh, right, <laughs> all the other right. people. What about yeah. college campuses with all the, you know, the frat? What he was saying, the alcohol. I mean, alcohol is always right. present, That's except you're not allowed to, to call it as part of the problem. It's part of the problem. Oh, it's absolutely. Part of the, it's a huge part of the problem. Most sexual assaults that we see perpetrated, both individuals ha have been drinking. And, you know, you don't really learn this in science class, but our tolerance as, a, as adults you know, at a 0 0.40 blood alcohol, which uh, 0.10 used to be DWI, amplify that by four, would kill us. It would shut the medulla down and it would prevent, you know, our, our bodies would forget to breathe and our heart rate and, and so on and so forth. At a, a young person that has little to no experience with alcohol, it could be half that. And I've lost uh, high school and college age kids to uh, at about a 0 0.20, hmm. which would be for for uh, I don't think I've ever been a point two zero, but it'd probably be about a dozen a dozen dozen beers or so. In reading your bio, I see that you have done stuff on college campuses. Do you? Yeah. How does that? Do you ever get any flack? Is there any accusations of being sexist since you're just addressing women, or is that uh, not an issue? 
No, no, I, I was, I worked for Campus Speak for five years. I traveled the country lecturing on sexual assault prevention, dating violence, spring break issues. And it was well received when I, after I did a lecture, I had a, a line of people that, that wanted to share their, their story with me. Now the social experiments are done. They've been done on college campus. They've been done in the Manhattan nightclub scene where I actually got five women in an hour on hidden camera to accept a drink and drink that drink. Uh, drink that drink with me on hidden camera under the presumption it contains GHB or gamma hydroxybutyrate. But no, the, the perception is not, uh, you know, I, I'm, I'm very, I'm so in tuned that some of my female students call me, hey, Steve's one of the girls, you know? <laughs> well, I, all I know is that I had a conversation with one of the big leaders on sexual assault on college campus. And when I dared to suggest alcohol, anything to do with it, she became enraged. And I said, do we want to solve the problem or don't we? Don't. No, it's a big, we, we'd be lying to ourselves. Are you a student so, leader? Said, no, it's, adult, it's, it's, academic. You know, it's a, it's a neurotoxin and it takes your, your, your ability to deal both mentally and physically if you choose to fight back. Well, it's, it, it suppresses it's part you. part of the it's, problem. It's, if we want to solve the problem, we're going to work on the problem. Either you want to solve the yeah. problem or you don't. Uh, all right. Yeah. Uh, uh, Steve, yeah, I, I'm not sure I got to yet. What is the new superpower? Is there one superpower that you're advocating? Uh, the new superpower for women is... Uh, uh, you know, with regard to your intuition, you, you trust your intuition, predict dangerous situations and defend yourself from the unthinkable. So it's, it's, a, it's a variety of things. It's me trying to put you in touch with your intuition, telling you what the predator's looking for in a target. And one of the most important things that I can ask a woman, ask anybody to do, even, even in law enforcement, I use this, is to create a blueprint for a plan of action. Now, in law enforcement, we call a visualization in the military, Military, they call it an emergency condition, where you'll sit down, you'll think of a problem. Somebody's breaking into your home and I'll go up to these young women and I'll get right on top of them and say, somebody's breaking into your dorm right now. They're coming through the door. What are you going to do? What are you going to do? And I want to I want to increase that 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 adrenal response. And they're like, I don't know, because they don't have a plan for it. When bad things happen, that's not a time to, 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 to create a plan. So if you think somebody, what would I do if somebody's breaking into my dorm? You know, you go into a designated safe room, the bathroom, lock the doors. If you have a security bar to, 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 to stop the door and make it even stronger, you do that. You make sure you visually see yourself grabbing your cell phone and, and bringing it with you. And you see yourself dialing, having that in your favorites, your, your campus police department, your local police department, dialing up and saying, my name is Mary Smith. I live at 123 Main Street uh, at the corner of uh, uh, Park Avenue. Uh, you know, um, someone's breaking into my apartment. Please send the police right now. And then they will tell you what to do. But if you don't think about that before it happens and you get that spike in your adrenaline, you know, I've seen women not be able to dial 911 when their children were having grand mal seizures. Yeah, we lose our fine motor coordination first thing. Yeah. At about 115 beats, we lose our fine motor skills. Yeah. And that could be a woman sticking her key into her, her car to unlock it. It could be a, a woman sticking her key into a door to unlock her apartment. And when you lose those fine motor skills, uh, you know, it's, it's, it, it's okay. It's the breakdown. Upwards of, of, you know, we're talking about the fine motor skills. Between 115 and 145, upwards towards 145, your complex motor skills break down. You're talking about, your heart, you're talking about your heart rate? I'm sorry. Yeah, that's your, your, your beats per minute yeah. upwards towards 145. Uh, your complex motor skills. Those are skills that we see in a lot of uh, karate schools. Uh, the, the skills that I teach, they're gross motor skills. They thrive between 145 and 175. Give us an example. Beats. Give an example of that. Well, we actually, when we teach our women's program, we put women in positions that they would find themselves in if they were being kidnapped sexually assaulted and domestically violated. So it makes it not brand new. They've been there. They've been there. They've done that. So they're better able to control their adrenal response. So God forbid a stranger takes a woman, throws her down, straddles her hips or gets in between her knees. A woman goes into that panic mode. And she goes and has this adrenal surge and that adrenal surge lasts a very short period of time. It could be 20 seconds. It could be 40 seconds. It could be 60 seconds. But once she exhausts that adrenal that adrenaline, she experiences the adrenal dump. So the better we're able to control that adrenal response, the better able we're going to be able to fight back and logically think about how can I unwind or back out of the situation. And, and you with, said you, you teach gross motor skills. Give an example of one. 
Uh, for example, using your trunk muscles, using the ground as your base, the reality uh, of what would happen in a sexual assault. Uh, take that same situation. If a, if a man was already uh, in between a woman's knees and rape would be imminent, you know, she would base on his chest. She can, can't move him. So she slides herself out. Her feet go into the hips. She grabs his wrists and she kicks right down the center line. It's called an up kick. And it's actually illegal in the UFC. Hmm. Uh, it's like uh, it's like a, a, a Larry Holmes uppercut uh, kicking up to down. This is your knockout area right here. And a woman with the ground as her base using her trunk muscles, bringing her strengths to a man's weaknesses, kicks along his center line. She can hurt somebody two and three times her size. I've been knocked out by uh, 90 pound girls wearing a, uh, a, a protective suit. Hmm. So I would assume things like mace and tasers are, unless you do the basic work you're teaching first, those can actually compromise somebody. They, th they have a false sense of security because they, uh, they have this weapon or, or whatever. Well, sometimes they, they may do something they might not ordinarily do. They may take a short stop or, or a shortcut. Uh, I don't care what you carry, but right. whatever you carry, you have to you practice with it. I, I'm a big proponent of, of, of pepper spray. Uh, I actually use this. I, I don't I don't make any money. I don't do it. But I carry the, the dad tiger light. And I like it because it wraps around your hand. It has a GPS a, a cert signal that's sent to your contacts. It also has a flashlight and it has a uh, military grade pepper spray. Mm -hmm. I carry one in my car, uh, in my, in my sun visor, uh, you know, as, as retired law enforcement, I carry a weapon 24, 24 seven, but deadly physical, deadly physical force is not always the answer to every solution. So I've carried pepper spray. I've used it in the field. I've been sprayed a number of times. I know how effective it can be, especially when it's used with the element of surprise. Let's go out to a call here. I don't quite have... Hey, over. Hello? Hi, what's your name? Hi, okay. Uh, Wendy. Hi, Wendy. What's going on? Uh, well, I'm a lifetime agoraphobic. I'm 55 years old. I'm listening to this being aware. I understand about being aware of your surroundings. But there comes a point when they basically just... When you just want to stay home. Well, but that, but that, say, at, but at that point, you just think, home. Oh, now you've got. Like she said, she called, she gave it a name, that, and she was right, agoraphobia, right. or agoraphobia, and that's now a medical problem. So you can go from being hyper vigilant, hyper aware, hyper uh, concerned to actually driving yourself into an anxiety disorder. Yes. Yeah. Did you have a bad experience that contributed to that, or that accentuated the agoraphobia? Uh, uh, yes. Somebody tried to abduct me when I was three. Okay. So there you go. Yeah. So trauma also. Have you had trauma therapies? Yes. What kind? Uh, talk therapy. Okay, that's not trauma therapy. So you need to you need to get back. Oh, sorry. Well, that's fine, but you need. Okay, to... remember this. Oh, jeez, this phone. Uh, go ahead. Re remember what? I'm sorry. It happened 52 years ago, so I, I mean it's pretty much part of who I am now. I understand, but trauma therapy can be done tomorrow, uh, and that is sort of rewiring your brain a little bit with things like EMDR and those sorts of things. So, which for takes sure, time. Which takes time. Twelve to eighteen months usually yeah. to rewire something. And somebody needs to really know what they're doing with it. And it's not about reliving this trauma or revivifying the feelings associated with it. It's just about changing how your brain manages it. Right. That's the way I think about it. But okay. sympathizing with where you're at, I mean, that's... Yeah, that's rough. That yeah. is some rough stuff. But that's not... That's a little different than what you're talking about, though, Steve, right? Yeah, you, you know, Dr. Drew, I, 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 I have professionals that I go to. I, I never go beyond my profession. So something like that, I, I would definitely... Uh, I would make a referral to uh, someone in the behavioral, in the behavioral right. field. Agreed. Well, Steve, I appreciate you being here with us. It's very interesting. The book is called The Superpower for Women. I'm, I'm very interested in autonomic sort of responses and how the body responds to it, that kind of thing. It's, it's, to me, that's so, so many right. different things. So many that are, people 
in treatment fields are ignorant of the whole vagal theory. I know, I know. Just, so that's, well, you know, the, the, the pepper spray that I mentioned, Dr. Drew, is it's wrapped around your hand. So if you were blitzed or you were frightened, if somebody jumped you and you have that autonomic response, like you mentioned, your, your hands would open, that it, it's still with you. So you get a second chance at it. And, you know, there's a lot of things that our body does naturally, especially if we haven't been exposed to a particular stimulus. Show, show us that thing again. I want to see it. Is like this a, is the, like, the Tiger Light Dad. It's, like a, uh, it's, it's, like got, a, it's got a flashlight that uh, once you do this you for the pepper spray and you depress the pepper spray, yeah. it sends a GPS alert uh, out to all of all of your, your contacts. Wow. It's a steep party, it is in danger, and it gives your exact location so that you can you can take some sort of action and it's immediate. Legal so, in, is it legal in all 50 states? What? You want that? It's legal in all 50 states. There are some states that will not allow you to say order it online but this pepper spray uh, this pepper spray is legal in all 50 states great give us the name one more time it's something dad tiger it's the dad tiger light the dad tiger light and the beauty of it is it's a, i was looking for something that was a flashlight pepper spray it's also can be a blunt object a blunt uh, striker mm, nice. and it is a gps locator so the minute you depress the pepper spray you're going to send a, a signal out to all of your contacts They'll know that you're in trouble. They're going to try and get a hold of you. And, you know, it's it's a case in which some of these crimes that we've seen where a young lady's out jogging, that it could have saved her life. Very good. Wow, that's great. I want one of those. I've seen it on Instagram. Oh, <laughs> you've seen it on Instagram? Yeah, we need no, to get those. those are those. cool. Yeah, Let's put them on the website. <laughs> yeah, we'll put them up. All right, Steve, well, thank you so much. We're going to take a couple of uh, emails, uh, but I'm going to say goodbye to you, and I thank you for spending some time with us. Thank you. My pleasure, Doc. Have a great weekend. Oh, oh wait, ticket. hold on a second. Let me make sure I got all your stuff out there. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Go to Steve Cardian, K A R D I A N, stevecardian.com. Also go to Jane Jitsu, not Jiu Jitsu, Jane Jitsu, J A N E J I T S U.com. So, stevecardian.com, Jane Jitsu.com. Check those out. And uh, thanks, Steve. Appreciate it very much. Go get the book. It's the new super, superpower for women. Thanks, Dr. Drew. Thanks, Dr. Bruce. God bless. Thank, Thank you. you, man. All right. I've got a couple of uh, uh -oh. emails for you. Okay. This is uh, this is somebody Georgia. She's looking for EMDR. My mother was given probation. I grew up with her. Uh, when she wanted me to do something for her, she would emotionally blackmail me. Uh, I am not and have not been an addict, but have dabbled in drugs. I'm 58. I'm proud of the progress I've made. Uh, she wants. That's just somebody wants EMDR. Uh, I don't. Let's try this one. <laughs> uh, reading about captivities. This is in relation to the Elizabeth Smart thing. Uh, I was held in captivity for five years. Age 12 and a half to 17 and a half. My, unfortunately, it was written about in the New York Times in 2007 wow. and it's Cosmopolitan. Uh, the New York Times printed, blah, blah, blah. In fact, some of the statements were wrong. All the fact checks were not accurate. The book by Judith Herman, Trauma and Recovery, helped me understand a lot of my feelings after I was able to function. However, now I'm back to living in fear. So she had some sort of a relapse. relapse. Every life stressor, I don't know how she's saying this. Every life stressor has raped me of any resilience I have. Hmm. Uh, I now live on clonidine, librium, and ciproheptidine. Ciproheptidine. Huh. I wonder why she'd be taking that. Uh, Perrin, oh, she takes it for nightmares. Oh, that's interesting. It, it does have that. It, 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 you can use it for like sleep terrors and things like that, ciproheptidine, strangely. Um, I was a piece of meat. Now I am worse. Even I have to watch my ringtones. It stimulates me psychologically. I lose it. Although the only person that calls me is my husband. Um... I don't know quite what she's asking for, except uh, actually she may want to get involved with the Smart Foundation. But Elizabeth Smart is trying to help women like this. Um, they are, you know, trying to hook people up with therapy and groups and things. You know, women support each other. Did she say clonidine or clonidine? Clonidine and oh, librium. Clonidine. Yeah. So, yeah. so it's an interesting combination of meds. Maybe get a second opinion. <laughs> yeah, but you, sometimes people use clonidine for. Uh, Agitation, oh sure, and, yeah, you know, stuff like ADHD. That. Yeah, it's QID, so they're using it for the sedating right prop property. It's not the patch, which is less sedating. I have addicts that want to continue after detox. They find it very useful <laughs> for anxiety and stuff. Yeah, I don't mind that. Yeah, people doing that. Um, in any event, uh, again, it's all really about having support and uh, trauma therapy and getting access Con to trauma. Continuing therapy. the therapy because yeah. some people feel that once they've addressed something and had improvement, that they're done. So. Okay, here's somebody has a question for you, Bruce, about the uh, dressing yeah, issue. Of course, that has to come through. Mm -hmm. uh, hey, Carol, go ahead, Carol, or Carol Ann. Do we have her? Yes. There um, you are. Go ahead. 
You want some dressing advice? No, go ahead. Go ahead there, Carol. <laughs> go ahead. You're on the air. I just had a question um, for Dr. Bruce because he seemed to be triggered on, unless I was taking it wrong, on the fact of how a female is dressing. Like that could be a trigger for a predator um, is how the female's acting or dressing instead of looking at why is someone a predator? Like he's blaming the female more. No, Doctor Mr. Cardian said I'm he said he's I'm just needed I teach women about high risk behavior that puts you at higher risk. That so women can manage the risk on their own. That was his that was Bruce brought it up, but okay. Cardian's one that said that he that's what he does. He teaches women you can choose to do whatever you want, but in terms of de- minimizing risk, he has a whole list of things that increase your risk and dress and whatnot are some of the things. Oh yeah. I I know how Steve feels, and I know what he said, but I was just going by what Dr. Bruce was stating, so I just wanted so, to ask him yeah. about that. Well, that yeah, I mean, I said sexuality, the way it's projected and promoted in media today, I think it is inappropriately provocative. I've worked with social workers that work with teenagers that feel that some of the uh, you know videos and and some of the entertainment material out there for young girls is so inappropriate, you could almost construe it as sexual abuse. So... Uh, blaming the woman for how she dresses is not what I'm implying, but I think that some of the dress is okay. highly inappropriate. And I think when you have celebrities projecting some of these behaviors, when it translates to teenage girls uh, emulating them, I don't think that's. that's well, I a think good what image. you said was if they're engaged in the behavior, well, they, they bring a bodyguard with them. Yeah, right. <laughs> and the, the teenager right. can't have a bodyguard. Yeah. So anyway, but yeah, because if I mean a female should be able to dress any way that she wants to dress, it, it doesn't give a man any. Hey, hey Carol Ann, we said that we to... said that Carol Ann, we said that specifically twice when it was brought up the first okay. time. I mean that we all, all three of us okay. articulated that. Why should we have to? We're trying to help save okay. lives here. Why? Why do? Why should we go back? Yeah, that's fine. I just must have misunderstood it. That's all. Okay. That's fine. All right. I. I just that I, I have no problem right. with the, your point because we agree with it. We are 100 percent agreement. But we're trying to save lives and to go back around about oh, this can, can diminish yeah. can diminish the the priorities. I, sometimes I feel like you know when teaching medical students and stuff like that, if they want to talk about pronouns, I. I, I we're tr- go, go take care of the patient. Just take care of the patient. Right. It, it really it it offends me. I'm I'm offended. Well, we can't do the work to take care of the patient if all these other things get in the way of it uh, about it, people's feelings. No, 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 no. You're, you're a physician. Go t- take care of the patient. Take care of the patient. That's it. Period. Right? Am I wrong? No, you're absolutely right. Yeah. I, I, I just really, it really bothers me. The, we can worry about all the other stuff outside, outside of the, 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 the what you're supposed to focus on, which is saving that patient's life. Right. Don't worry about your feelings right now. In fact, you should learn how to focus on that patient even when you're feeling horrible. The more horrible, the better. Focus on the patient. Right. I, I think she's coming from the place where there are men out there. And there's recently a book on on male uh, some hegemony and just how, how the male-dominated society projects certain authoritarian bad images. But I think she's reacting to there are men that blame women. Oh, well. Yeah, we know. can't blame the victim. And that's that's horrible. Not. So I, horrible. I'm sorry if I even projected a percentage of that type of viewpoint I wasn't applying. Yeah, let, so let's be 100% clear. Right. Uh, rather than focusing on helping people not get hurt, we're going to state again, which we've stated multiple times, that blaming the victim never is something we would do under right. any circumstances. Absolutely. And if we somehow t- stumble over our la- language that give you the impression that we're making victims responsible for anything that happens. And of course, that's nothing to do with us. Of course. Yeah. All right. Hmm. You're going to be okay? <laughs> I'm thinking of the students that bog down in that stuff and they, when they need to be focusing on the, the patient and the care and the, saving the life and the, their skills and those kinds of things. That's when I really get I get violated I'd rather be raped myself <laughs> than, 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 than have to have people who's responsible for saving people's lives worrying about things they shouldn't be worrying about. Worry about that later. Worry about the patients, making the patient better. Yeah. I right? think in society today is so polarized that, that there are things that you can say that sometimes people associate with, associate with certain um, viewpoints that are – Yes, that are so, real negative. So. Yeah, but know your allies. Yes, and, and know who you need to school. Right. 
I don't think Dr. Bruce, the guy, needs to be schooled on this. Do you? <laughs> no, the guy needs to be schooled. On no, this? but I understand it. I mean, I understand it too, and it makes me upset to be even be even thought of in the same category with any of that. Right. I try and be a buffer when I'm working in the ER. If I come into a shift and I don't have the enough buffering energy, then sometimes you can react. What do you mean buffering energy? What do you mean? Well, you know, you some, you know, some patients are unreasonable and they're angry, and and I just have to if I have a you know a lot of if I get sleep and exercise and I come in, then I can. I have to put myself in their place, and sometimes frustrations people have, or the sensitivity, like this individual, she, I don't know what her background is, I don't know what she's experienced, but she represents a certain sensitivity to their men out there that, that are, it's sort of a very subtle blaming of women. It's not subtle sometimes. Yeah. It's, it can be subtle or it can be explicit. Yeah. Unacceptable. Right. We never would be. That's why we stated it. Right. So we clarified that. Yeah. But. And the, well, it was clarified when we first brought it up. But right. should we not have brought it up? No, no. That's the horrible thing because there, some people will not bring it up because they're fearful of taking this heat. Yeah. You don't bring it up, somebody's going to die. Yeah. Not, not because they shouldn't be able to dress that way. They should be able to do whatever the hell they want. But somebody, they, but somebody may put themselves at risk and not understand they're putting themselves right. at risk. Well, Unless I, somebody teaches them. How how to manage risk? I think it's part of what we're talking about. Sometimes when you work with adolescent, I've worked with adolescents. So if you when you work with adolescent girls that have been victimized, sometimes they will dress provocatively. That's part of their that's part, of the, part of the disorder. Yes, yes. And so I'm more coming from that viewpoint, and it's and it's just like helping them to see what. They're, and if they still want to do it, however they want to do it, that's fine. But right, sometimes it's re, it's they are reliving their their uh, being very uh, well. Anyway, so. I'm, Probably yeah. beating it. Yes. All right. Yeah. So uh, that'll about do it for today. Uh, wow. Oh, wait. We have another call coming in. Uh-oh. Oh. Oh. <laughs> it's oh, not boy. related. Is that bad? <laughs> okay. We don't have Mike. Mike, what's up? Okay. We don't have Mike. Mike. Oh, boy. Hey, Dr. Drew. What's up, man? Hey, man. So you had a recent. Actually, uh, that's kind of funny. So you had a... Whoops. We have a terrible connection. You have yeah. a recent, recent diagnosis? Diagnosis? Yeah. Yeah, that's not going to work. Okay. Do, yeah. do you have do you have a ear headphones on or something? Do you have, do you have a ear headphones on or something? No. Yeah, that's Is that better. Try it again. Yeah. Turn down your. Try it again. Is it any better? No. All okay. I hear is my voice coming back. Unfortunately, he says he was recently diagnosed with dissociative identity disorder. A mm. male. That's which I've I've never, I've never dealt with a male that had this. I've uh, maybe I have. Yes, I have. And I think about it, but I would be interested in talking to him if. Uh, uh, let's see. We should, we should get his number calling back at some point because I've never. Now, this is my caller is that these are tips for avoiding abuse while the larger issue is fixed. Maybe that was uh, Carol Ann again. I don't know what that is. Let me try one more time with uh, Mike. Mike, go ahead there. Mike? No, no. Yeah. Oh, mm-hmm. I'm sorry, Mike. All we hear is. He's in outer space. Yeah, it's my dissociative happening. identity coming back at me. Email us your phone number because. Even if it's not today, yeah, I'd love do, to talk to so, next show. Yeah, sure. So tell everybody what we're doing next because we'll we'll wrap this up and then you can tell everybody that who's coming on. So next. next we have our very favorite guest. We have Nicole and Jemmy. So you want to stay around for that. You do not want to miss her. And then don't forget and, about Elizabeth Smart. And don't forget about Elizabeth Smart. Uh, that is coming up November 20th. It's the, tonight. It'll be. It is tonight. If, if, oh, you're, actually, if you're listening to this later in the week, it will have been earlier in the week, but it's November 20th. Uh, and it's at 10 o'clock on A&E. But you can find it right now at anetv.com. You can get all and check your local listings. But uh, we appreciate you being a part of that. Uh, and uh, again, Steve's book is The New Superpower for Women. Don't forget about that. Steve Cardian. SteveCardian.com. Also, janejitsu.com. And uh, excellent. Bruce. Great. Also, I want to get one of those Papa Tigers or Daddy Tigers or whatever those yes, devices I wrote are. it down, and now I've already lost it. But yeah. yes, I'm going to get one of those myself. So thank you all. We'll see you next time. Remember, you can find all these podcasts at drdrew.com. The Dr. Drew podcast, the This Life podcast, and the Adam and Drew podcast, which is available five days a week. Find them all on iTunes and rate us five stars. Subscribe and get it first. And if you're really happy, click on the Amazon banner at drdrew.com to help support the show. We'll thank you for it. If you join the email list via drdrew.com slash contact, we'll send you a weekly infusion newsletter with Dr. Drew's News. We're so grateful when you get in touch. We read all your emails and we'll bring you the subject matter you want to hear about. You live. Well, one of the great parts about working in recovery is seeing former patients successfully move on 
And I've had patients that have come up to me years later and uh, shake my hand and say, you know, sometimes people are kicked out of treatment. And uh, many of these folks move on to become mental health professionals themselves. And of course, the field of psychology is vast. The need for competent practitioners is huge. If you're considering this rewarding career, I urge you to consider the California School of Professional Psychology at Alliant University. Now, I've known them for a long time at Alliant University. I've spoken at their past events. It was founded in 1969. It's boasts an alumni network of nearly 50,000 people worldwide. And Alliant has fostered many of today's mental health pioneers, authors, and advocates. CSPP at Alliant University hosts both on-ground and online programs in business psychology, marriage and family therapy, clinical counseling. They also offer APA-accredited doctoral programs in clinical psychology that can allow for specialization in child psychology, clinical forensic psychology, and integrated psychology. And the faculty is crazy. It's made up of, of leaders and historical figures like Abraham Maslow, Carl Rogers, Viktor Frankl, some of the true fathers of modern psychology. For more information, and I've worked alongside of these students as well, by the way, in the clinical setting, as well as having lectured at the institution. So for more on the California School of Professional Psychology, CSPP at Alliant, click the Alliant banner on our website or visit Alliant, A-L-L-I-A-N-T dot E-D-U, Alliant dot E-D-U.